Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 424. This program is dedicated by Yecheskel Goodfriend in loving memory of his father, David ben Yecheskel Halevi, a true mensch. So we're now in the week of Chayesara, the chapter Chayesara in the Torah, the fifth chapter from the beginning of the book of Bereshis, Bereshis Noyach Lech Lecha Vayera Chayesara, which means the life of Sarah. This week is also the birthday on Monday, the 20th of Cheshvan is the birthday of the Rebbe Rashab. So we'll actually begin with that, being that it's closer to us, meaning it's Monday, and then we'll go to Chaya Sarah. Many different questions have come in, as well as timely questions about many different topics. And I continue to invite you always, because the heart and soul of this program are your questions. Please, submit your questions. It's completely anonymous. Every question is acceptable. Nothing's taboo. At chsidisapply.com, there's a forum and uh, please take advantage. I might as well mention chassidusapplied.com is a platform for many Hasidic resources, but applying it all to our lives, meaning practical, emotional, psychological application. We also have a weekly Tanya Applied class. I'm up to chapter 9 in Tanya. That's every Saturday night. You can find all that, all the archives on chassidusapplied.com plus much more material. Okay. So let's begin with uh, Chav Cheshvan. The 20th of Cheshvan, te- Cheshvan and the 20th of Cheshvan, Tafresh Chav Aleph, which is the equivalent of 1861. The Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, was born. And as uh, the Tzamech Tzedek, who was uh, the Rebbe at the time, he would, his talkus would be in Tafresh Chavov five years later. So he said that being born Chav Cheshvan in the year Tafresh Chav Aleph is the word Keser. Chav is Keser, the acronym Rosh Tevis of Keser, 20. And Tafresh Chav Aleph is the letters Kisra in Aramaic, that's Keser. So he associated the Rebbe Rashab with Keser. And indeed, in the great magnum opus of the Rebbe Rashab, which is Hemshech Tofresh Ayim Beis, or Hemshech Terav, Hemshech Ayim Beis, referring to the year Tofresh Ayim Beis when he began delivering that long Hemshech, long series of discourses. The year was Tofresh Ayim Beis, 1912, on Shavuos, which would span for 144 discourses, and then a whole other book on other section that he just wrote and was not delivered. So what is the central theme of that magnum opus is Keser. Begins with Keser and throughout that's the undercurrent. Keser being the interface between the divine and existence. Keser is of course a word from, the, from Kabbalah, means, means crown. But in Kabbalah it refers to the level that's higher than Atsilis, higher than the ten spheres. Like the crown that's on top of the head, on top of the entire human being created in the Tzalem Elikim, the divine image. So Spiritually, it signifies a level that transcends. Within Kesar itself, there are two levels, Atik and Arich, Atik Yemen and Arich Ampin. And as he explains in that Hemshech and many other places in Chassidus, taken from Kabbalah, especially Eitz Chaim from the Arizal, that Kesar is the interface. Because God wanted to have a relationship. How can you have a relationship between a creator and a creation, between the infinite and beyond infinite with the finite, the immortal and beyond immortal with the mortal. So Torah in general teaches us that God manifested himself in Torah, in the wisdom of Torah, that's God's wisdom, God's blueprint for existence, but it's also a wisdom that relates and tells us of how God wanted to create the world and how he created the world. Like we learn in Sefer Bereshis, in Pasha Bereshis, I should say. And it's all about the understanding God's process, because God wants us to have that relationship with Him. And it also tells us how we climb the steps from the bottom up through our Avedis Hashem, through our work in refining ourselves and creating this relationship. 
So where's the meeting point? So though all Seder Shtashas, the entire cosmic order is really there to create these stepping stones, so to speak, between divine and existence. But Kesser plays a prominent role because on one hand it's Rotzen, it's the desire of God that he wants to have an existence, he wants to have a relationship. On the other hand, desire is not yet the details. The details, the desire to have a home is the general desire that reflects the source, the one who desires. And then that desire in, in turn manifests in the spheres of Chachma, Bina, Das. When you don't count Kesser, you count Das, but that's a separate discussion. Chesed, Gvurit, Teferes, Netzach, Chayid, Malchus. And there you have the structure of that. The ten statements which God created the world. Now you have structure. So building a home requires two things. The one wants the home. That's the Rotson, so that's like the Keser. And then how it comes down into the actual details. So Keser plays that in-between state, as he says right at the beginning of Ayin Beis, of the Hemshech. Now without Rotson, there's no interrelationship. There's no relationship. If I don't have a desire to do something, I remain in my world, and you remain in your world. So the first step is Ola Beretzene, the rose in God's will, which of course always has to be understood in conceptual terms, not physical terms, and not space or, t- or physical space or time, conceptual terms, the desire of God. So when we say, Sheke the Shon of you're talking about God's will. Then it says the details of what, what exact mitzvah may be. So Kesser plays that interface, and the Rebbe Rashab indeed becomes a central theme in his Maimonim. The Rebbe Rashab is known as the Rambam of Chassidus, which means he brought together all the different sugis, all the different topics and themes and conversations on Chassidus from the Alter Rebbe and organized it in one organized system, showing the connection between the different topics creating this elaborate, comprehensive blueprint, which we can call the deepest and most comprehensive expression of Kabbalah and Chassidus that we have. The Rebbe Rashab, that's what he was known for. Rambam of Chassidus. Additionally, the Rebbe Rashab also established Temchet Mimim, which is the second great contribution among hundreds and many more contributions. I'm just pointing out two central ones. And that is an actual training ground to train young men, and today also the, the women's schools, young women, in the methods of Teda and the methods of Chassidus, but above all to use that Teda and Chassidus to conquer the world, to transform the world, the material world, into a spiritual environment. And the challenges would be many. So was, you have to learn Teda to know. But then there's another th- aspect which is called application. So the Yeshiva Stem Chetpim was established to additionally, to the addition to the learning, to apply it, as the Rebbe Rashab explains in Kuntur Seitz Achaim, which he, where he explains the purpose of the Yeshiva Stem Chetpim, which he established in Tofresh Nun Zayin, 1897. And uh, in, the, in the famous talk that he gave in Tofresh Samachalov in 1901, on Simchas uh, Teda, Kola David, referring to the students of the Yeshiva, as soldiers in the army of the of David, of the, of King David. And what is he referring to? A mocham ruchnis, a spiritual war. Not a war with weapons, God forbid, but a spiritual war, beruach, in spirit, to transform the material world into a spiritual environment. To make a home for God in this world. Basically, to take keser, as explained in Chesidus, based on Kabbalah, and make it an actual reality, where there is an interface, where we can live in a world which on one hand seems so antithetical to the divine, to godliness, but align it because that's its deeper purpose and align it to live up to its real calling and its true purpose, which is to be a home for the divine. So with that, a short overview of the Rebbe Rashab. I'll answer a few questions that came in. Um, why is the fifth Chabad Rebbe called the Rebbe Rashab? Why is the fifth rabbi of the Chabad dynasty called the Rebbe Rashab? Is it because he had a, 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 rash, a rash of new and great ideas to modernize and spread the movement of Chassidism in the early 20th century? 
<laughs> well, the word rash is, okay, interesting play of words. Rash is a word in English. Rashab simply is an acronym for Rabbeinu Sholem Ber. Sometimes fully written out, Mehur Rashab or Mur Rashab. Reino Arav Reb Sholem Ber. Sholem David Ber was the Rebbe Rashab's name. So just like some, you can refer to the Rebbe Rayatz, Rabbi Yisuf Yitzchak, or the Rebbe Marash, which is, uh, his name was Shmuel. And the same thing with uh, others that you use, uh, make an acronym of the name. Is there something deeper? I've never heard or seen something from the Rebbeim that explained the actual acronym, the meaning of it. But that's the simple explanation. If you can read in other words. I wouldn't use the word modernize. I would use apply. I would use spread is good. Explain chassidus in a language that develops its ideas in a language that we can all understand. And Rabbi Rashab definitely did that. So... I don't really see the connection, but I uh, appreciate the thought. But he did create a rash of, of great, new and great ideas. When we say new, and Torah new always means that it's not new and an original coming from and based on what came before, but it's new in its application. It's new in its development. That's why we say, everything that a student, a great student, teaches and is mechadish, innovates, I was given to Moshe at Sinai. The Rebbe Rashab actually has, mentioning the Rebbe Rashab, a, a, a humorous statement he writes in one of his places, in Be'er Kuntas Yitzchayim actually, that they're such students, that so, their chedushim are so great, they weren't even given at Sinai. Meaning, obviously, uh, that those chedushim are not worthy of <laughs> the page they're written on. So a real chedush, and this is true, the Havdal in science as well, is not completely new. It takes ideas that were there before and develops them in such a new way. You say, wow, now I appreciate them. Now I understand them. So the Klal, the general principle, was given at Sinai. And the Chiddush is the, the great Talmud Vosik that's able to draw out from it. I'm just mentioning it in context. We should understand the balance between the two. Okay. Uh, they say uh, there was a professor who wrote a paper, and he spent uh, half of his life writing this paper, and he was, this was his great contribution. He presented it to his colleagues, his fellow wizards of the world, and they came back, and the consensus was, they said, your paper is good and original. So he was, wow, good and original, beautiful. They said, the problem is the part that's good is not original, and the part that's original is not good. You get the idea. Okay. Moving on. What was the Rebbe Rashab's most important teaching and how is it still relevant to us over 100 years since his passing? It's very difficult to choose a, uh, a, a, in general a most important teaching of any scholar, especially a Rebbe, especially a Chassidus. Because how do you define most important? Is the most important is the first verse of the tale that God created heaven and earth. So it's hard to really make that statement. I think it's something that is really relative. Different people learning different things. At that point, that's the most important point to be learned. The same thing from the Rebbe's point of view. When he said it, that was the most important point to emphasize. And like any intelligence system, it has many fundamentals. If you want to say a fundamental principle, so I just explained the Kesser, the idea of interface. But I, would I say this the Rebbe Rashab? Or it's in general chassidus, in general Kabbalah. And, and Torah in, in general was given. God's book, given to us to be able to understand God's mind, to understand God's will, to understand the plan of existence, to understand how we should live our lives. Torah Melosh But the Rebbe Rashab, no question that he elaborated on it and made it a very fundamental cornerstone. In context of, uh, of chidushim in general, I can mention one or two in Hemshech Samach Vov, which is another classic uh, series of discourses that were delivered in Tofrei Samach Vov through Tofrei Samach Ches. So that would be the equivalent of 1906, 1905 through 1907. The Rebbe Rashab, um, in that discourse, one of the great classic discourses within that series of discourses, that Hemshech, is Vayelech Samach Vov. So though, again, most of it is based on Tzamech Tzedek's Mimer, but has many additions, which today we can compare, 
And especially when he talks about the Chiddush of the Alter Rebbe and the Indian of Oyer. That the Alter Rebbe was Mechadish in Nagar Sakedish 20, the Indian of Oyer. So the way the Rebbe Rashab explains it there, that's one of the highlights. And again, I'm being very hesitant calling it that because, as I said, highlights are everywhere. But there's no question that's a tremendous understanding in understanding the interface between a built in Mitzvah Nimtza God, a God that is what's called a non existential reality, meaning he exists but not in any way but we can relate to that existence, and how that ultimately interacts with the world of existence itself. And that Oyr has something that is completely bottled, completely selfless. At the same time, it exists. And he explains how that's a chiddush even compared to the Ramak and the Rameh and great Kabbalists who were struggling with this issue of interfacing. On one hand, you want to connect to God on God's terms. On the other hand, you want to connect to the world on, world, on, on existence terms. Can you bring these two together when they're so antithetical? So it's a long discussion there, but that's one thing that jumps out at me when I'm thinking about it. And then throughout, throughout the Mamar of the Rebbe Rashab, especially when you compare it to previous Rebbeim, you see the Chidushim, you see the elaboration, the explanations. And above all, as I said, in just the mere scope of it all, what the Rebbe called about Ayim Beis, he said, Nefloyes, wonders, even compared to the wonders of Samach Vov. So all of it adds up to tremendous contributions, especially in the Havon of Asoga, the understanding. Many things before the Rebbe Rashab were brief, not so much elaborate, the Rebbe Rashab developed it where you can understand the scope of it all. In many ways, we talk about Mishnah and Gemara. Gemara de- develops ideas in Mishnah. So again, it's not completely original in that sense, but it's original because it develops it in a way that we can fully appreciate. That would be what I would say about um, the Rebbe Rashab. On the practical note, the establishment of the Yeshiva Tempchat Mimim also contributed a tremendous element, which is it's not just enough to learn it, but we have to actually, as I mentioned before, have a training ground, trainings of young men and women who will go out to the world and use chassidus to impact and inspire everyone possible that you can reach. And that's what chassidus does. It takes the teda and demonstrates the neshama of teda, reveals the soul of teda in a way that every person can relate to it in their personal lives. We have a tradition that before the Rebbe Rashab opened Temchet Mimim, which is the yeshiva, it's called Temchet Mimim, he first went to pray at the kvarim of his ancestors. He went to the oil of his predecessors, including his father, his grandfather, and so on. Um, we go all the way back to the Alter Rebbe. And what did he go there? That He went to pray there that all the, stu- all the students, including those who would enroll in the yeshiva, in the future would be successful spiritually and materially. My entire life I've been struggling with both materially and spiritually. As a former student of Bavitch Yeshiva, Tebchit Mimim, what can I do differently to manifest and reveal these blessings from the Rebbe Rashab and be more successful? Well, not to deflect from the question, but the question really is a much broader one. The Torah tells us, in Bukhukesei Telechu, Nesati Gishmechem Be'itam. If you will follow the ways of my laws and mitzvahs, I will give you blessings. The rain will come in its time, but gishmechem also means material blessings. And someone could say, one second, I do Torah mitzvahs, completely observant of Torah mitzvahs, and I don't always see those, I don't always see those blessings. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a similar question. So the answer, the classic answer is, Firstly, you may have blessings that you don't necessarily recognize. Ein bala nes Sometimes the person experiencing a miracle doesn't recognize it. To come in form may not come in the form you consider success, but you're alive, healthy, have a good family. Some people are blessed with more wealth than others. So that's number one: appreciating the blessings we have, not taking them for granted. Number two. God has his mysterious ways. We don't always know how the blessings will come, when they will come, in what form and fashion. So yes, we all hope, hope and pray should be beteva nireva nigla in a very revealed way, in a way that we can relate to, in a way that we appreciate. But it doesn't always happen in exactly that form because at the end of the day, there's a creator. 
So God, a creator and the one who governs the world and knows what is best for us. So the same thing here. The Rebbe Rashab establishing yeshiva also wanted to make sure to empower his students and give them the best possible chance to be matzliach. So that's, of course, a true shepherd, a true founder, a true leader. That's what he's going to do, just as Moshe Rabbeinu did what he had to do to, to, to protect and to provide all the needs and resources for his people. So that's why the Rebbe Rashab said this. And the success <coughs> refers to both success personally as well as success in their learning and in their application. Now, if you think about it, this is back in 19, I said 1897 when he established the yeshiva. Look what happened afterwards. The 1900s came. World War I, World War II. I don't have to elaborate what kind of upheaval, what kind of destruction happened to the Jewish people, including to students of Lubavitch yeshivas. Many were killed, displaced. But look today, here we are, the year 2022, Tov Shin Pei Gimel, talking about, talking about, we're talking quite a number of years since then. And would you say he was Masliach with his uh, prayers? Look, you have thousands, tens of thousands of students that have come out from the yeshiva's Temchat women all over the world. Today they're branches. And not just come out and graduated, but gone out to change the world. Every shliach, every shlucha in existence is essentially a product from this yeshiva system. Now, is everyone successful? The answer is what you mean by success. They, they impact people. They change lives in good ways. Some may be wealthier than others. Some raise money more than others. But overall, it's a success story. And even when someone say, one second, I don't see the success in every detail, you look close enough, you'll find successes. It all depends what you define as success. So I would say the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Um, and today, it's not speculation. You look back, the reality is. And we're talking about something that was promised in 1897. So we're talking now um, 20, uh, 125 years ago. What did you know Zion until we are today in Pafrit Shimpei Gimel? That's a long time, and not just long time, with all that, that transpired. So that's the answer. Regarding yourself, you have to make a keli, you have to continue doing your work in life. Learn chsidis, Rebbe Rashab chsidis, especially this week. Apply it to your life, in Avedis Hashem, in serving God, in reaching others and inspiring others. You keep at it in a dedicated way, in a committed way, the blessings have come already and shall come even in more abundance. There's no question about it. And if you need to speak to Mashpi or to someone to help acclimate yourself, appreciate it. That's also vital. Not definitely not to bring not to be hard on yourself or to bring yourself down by saying, look, I've done this and that, but it means struggling materially and spiritually. So we all struggle, we all have our struggles, but we also have our strengths. And that's what we have to accentuate and focus on. And the Zgula of Adyem Hayledis of the Rebbe Rashab, who established the yeshiva, definitely will also help support that result. God, Hashem should bless you, Taka, to have great success materially and spiritually. But we have to forge ahead despite any challenges we may have. And know that every challenge we also have given strengths to deal with those challenges. Okay. More questions came in, but I want to move on and cover more ground. I always say to myself every week, this week I'm going to try to cover a lot more of the back, things backlog, so we can start really uh, addressing many questions. I feel bad every time a question is not addressed immediately. I really do feel that I owe it in a way to the person who wrote, who spent time and is either struggling with a question, it's an issue that's bothering them, and I feel that when someone writes to me, I feel that the need to respond. So I apologize, but simply there's too many questions for me to address all in one program. So I'm trying to work through it. So bear with me. So this applied now to Chayasada. Let's move to Pasha Chayasada. There's a bunch of questions, and then we have follow-up, and 
some relevant issues that are happening right now in the world, which I definitely want to get to. I believe I will be able to today, at least to some of them. And then I have a whole series of questions about prayers that came in over Tishrei. I also think of very important questions that are very timely. Try to get to that as well. Okay, let's move here. So Chaya Sara, let's start with some opening, an opening remarks. It means the life of Sara. Now, as the Rebbe points out many times, the name of a Parsha, even though we don't know exactly who gave the name, but the name became part of Mini Yisrael, custom by Jews, we use those names. A name, as the Alter Rebbe says in Shaykh Amuna, indicates the, the essential message of the chapter. So you would think, Chayes Sara, what happens next? You're going to read the life of Sara. Well, lo and behold, the first verse, literally, by Yishnei Chayes Sara, and talking about her death, her passing. It's saying, Chayes Sara, the life of Sara was 100, Me'ev Esrim V'Sheva Shanim, 127 years. And she passed on. So if the word Chayes Sara means the life of Sara, but you read the whole verse, the context is, that these were the years of the life of Sarah. If you want the life of Sarah, it was the previous chapter. Vayera. Olech l'chayv. But especially Vayera. Both those chapters. So, truth in advertising, so to speak. The name is deceptive. And the Rebbe's explanation is so powerful. I use it all the time. Is what defines life. So biological medical definition, we know. Someone breathing, their heart is beating, their mind is working. The Torah tells us the true meaning of life. We say, Wicked people, even in their lifetimes, they're called dead. What does that mean, dead? Because they're spiritually dead. They're not connected to their purpose. They're not living up to what they should be doing. It's like when people say, yeah, I'm physically alive, but I feel like a zombie. I feel dead inside. I don't mean physically dead. Sadikim gambe misosim kruim chayim. The righteous, even in their deaths, they're called alive. Because their life is, as the Alter Rebbe explains in Nagar Sakedish, it's chayim ruchnim, spiritual life. It's not life of flesh, not chayim psorim. It's the life of av, v'yira, and amuna. Love and reverence and, lo- and faith in God. Something eternal. That never dies. Mazare b'chayim afu b'chayim. It passed on to the children. Now we see, what's the story in Chai Sara? You want to know when someone's alive, look at the impact they've had on people. We're talking about Sara now, thousands of years after her passing. That's called being alive. The impact, Yitzchak was shaped by her. Look at Avram grieving Sara. We'll start with that. Yitzchak was shaped to the point when he went to look, when Rivka came. And brought him as a soulmate. How did he know whether she's the right one? He brought her into the tent of Sarah. Because Sarah's values lived on through Rivka. Her virtues, her qualities. So the Torah is telling us, you want to know the life of Sarah? Look at the day after she's no longer physically here. And then you'll see what real life is about. That's briefly the point. It's a tremendous lesson in general. Now we, of course, want both together the spiritual life that lives on in a physical body. And that's why ultimately Tris HaMesim will be the rejoining of body and soul. But don't ever think that because someone physically passed on, and God should bless everyone with Arich Yamim and long healthy years, Chaim Nitzchim, going straight into Mashiach, but even if someone passed on, don't think that everything is dead. The physical body, but their good deeds, their mitzvahs, their impact, their legacy lives on. That's the key thing to always remember. And that's why the Jewish people are here today. Because we always understood that. That as much as the physical is important, but all the wealth you accumulate and all the physical objects that you gather, all is temporary. It's all, it's all mortal. All subject to change. It erodes, it deteriorates and perishes. The only thing that lives on is a nitzchis, is the soul. But the soul is not disconnected. The soul has impacted this world. So our arms and legs and our very bodies, like in the case of Sarah, channeled the vehicle for the divine will and for the soul's role in this world. And you see that in the generations that follow. Okay, with that said, 
Let's go through a few questions that came in on this chapter. Are there any lessons that singles having difficulty finding a shidduch can learn from Eliezer's successful mission of finding Rivka for Yitzchak? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's why we're told the story. And in great detail. More detail than many other stories. Actually repeated three times. Because it is the first, you can call the first shidduch story in the Torah. We have Odem Achava. But there they're already, they're born, they're created for each other. Avram and Sarah, we already told once they already met. Here you actually see the dating process, if you wish, or the choosing process, where Rivka is, is uh, Eliezer, the servant of Avram, goes and finds her, comes back. So there are many, many lessons. We don't have the time in this program to go through all of them, but you can develop, I would say, a volume, many volumes of dating tips and marriage tips just on this chapter. I'll just point out one. I mentioned before that when Rivka finally meets Sarah, when Rivka, I'm sorry, meets Yitzchak, and Yitzchak says, it says, Vayoveya, he brought her into Sarah's tent. And Rashi brings from, from Medrash, what was the point of bringing him to the tent? He saw in the tent, he saw three virtues, three attributes that reflected his mother. One, the near Dalek Me'erev Shabbos, letter of Shabbos, a flame that she lit, burned from Friday to Friday. Second, it was an onon, a cloud of glory, an aura that hovered over the tent. And third, Rocha Metsi Be'isa, a blessing in the yeast, in the isa, in the dough, I should say. As explained by many, the Rebbe explains it, that these are the three mitzvahs, which is the foundation of a Jewish home. Ne'er Shabbos, Shabbos, lighting Shabbos candles. The second, Taras Meshpacha, which is reflective of the cloud, the purity, the aura, the refinement of the home. And third, Kashrus, the dough. Rosh Hashanah, Chana, or Hachain, Chala Nida Hadlokas Neris. So I've explained it quite extensively in association also with his own mother, his name was Chana, and of course, Chana Hanavia, the one that Chana that, that gave birth to, uh, to uh, Shmuel. The point being is that these three virtues are not just technical. What do they represent? They res- represent personality. So that's the first thing we can learn from it. That when you're going on a shit, what are you looking for in your spouse? So we're not taking away from physical beauty and emotional compatibility and intellectual compatibility, but above all, you're looking for eternal values. Someone you can trust. Someone you can build a home with. Someone you know that will be a partner with you in life. And this is just one of many lessons that we can learn from this week's chapter. Prioritizing. What are the priorities when you date? Both lessons for the man and both lessons for the woman. To know what's vital, what's absolutely necessary, and what's optional. Not to make a means into an end, and to focus on those ends, which are the virtues, trusting someone, kindness. I often ask people who are dating, and I say, well, tell me the two, three, or three most important things. And not everyone always says, kindness or trust, having a partner in life. People say all kinds of different things, and many of them are beautiful things, but this is one of the things that's creating that laser focus of what's most important in a person's life. And it is the eternity, because you're building a binyan adayat, an eternal edifice. Why did God bless the Ovis with children, and not something more spiritual such as Gan Eden, Elam Haba? Why did he actually, why did he usually bless them with mundane things such as land, and many children. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure the context of the question, but let me put it this way. I don't know if there's a greater blessing than children. You say spiritual. Children are not mundane. The greatest blessing in life is having children. Besides the fact that nachas, the joy of you have that, you have the power and God gave you a gift to shape a life. And look what children can bring to their parents, the joy, the great joy, that is nothing comparable. 
but you also, it's the secret to eternity. It's the greatest gift, prud of war, milas sa'aretz, when Hashem blessed Adam Machaba and the human race, that you do not die. You bring children into the world, they carry your genes, your DNA, and you pass that on, you pass on your legacy. Are there challenges? Of course there are challenges, but it's the greatest blessing in, in, in life is, is having children. And it is the secret to eternity. The only thing Chassidus says that creates yesh ma'ayin. Yesh ma'ayin means something from nothing. So God is total yesh ma'ayin, creating something that not, has no precedent. But imagine, just the seed of a father, the egg of a mother, and it conceives what? A child, look, a full-blown child, ultimately, after nine months of pregnancy. That's not a miracle. So I'm not sure why that is being seen as, uh, from the point of view of Torah and Chassidus, it's greater than Gan Eden and Elam Haba and all the Elam Yisruchim. And finally, we all know what the Alter Rebbe writes in Perek Lamed Vav in Tanya. From the Medr. Nisava Kodesh Baruch Ali Yisleiz Baruch Dira B'Tachtenim. He wanted a home in this lowest of worlds. All the higher worlds, including Gan Eden and Elam Haba, Hoi Lehem Yiridim Eir Ponav Yisbaruch. They're, you need, they're, they're very highly spiritual levels. But compared to the levels higher than them, they're lower. It's only this world where something is completely new. So I wouldn't dismiss mundane things. In addition to everything I've said about children, including the blessings when you talk about land, nesati, gishmech, and be'itam, as I mentioned before. Okay. We see that the Ovis had difficult children, Yishmal, Esav. If the Ovis were unable to raise their children properly, what chance do we have with ours? Another question, what parenting lessons, if any, can we learn from the Ovis and the Mois, from the patriarchs and the matriarchs? Well, I would say the exact contrary. If the Ovis had perfect children, then you'd say, how can we compare to the Ovis? They're so superior to us. We're simple mortals, simple people. On the contrary, when you f- see that Avram Yotzim Emenu Yishmol, as Siddhis explains, Yotzim Emenu, it wasn't exactly aligned to the chesed of Gedusha of Avram Avinu. And, Yish- and Esav, Yitzchok Yotzim Emenu Esav. Esav was a warrior, not exactly aligned to the pachad Yitzchok, to the gvur and reverence of God of Yitzchok. Yes, indeed, Avram also had Yitzchok. And, and, and Yitzchok had Yaakov. But they also had to deal with Yishmol and Esau respectively. So on the contrary, it teaches us, even the great of us and Imois, who had, who are Merkava Mamish, complete vehicle, completely aligned with what God wants, had their challenges. And you learn from how they behaved. Firstly, the unconditional love on one hand, the constant attempt to help improve their child's life, and sometimes the need for discipline. Like in the story when Sarah tells Avram and Hashem tells him to listen to Sarah, to send away Yishmol. Here's not the place to go into the very lessons, but that's exactly the point, that you can learn much from that. Even how Yitzchok deals with Esau. And even how Yaakov and Rivka deal with it in a different way. All these are lessons in parenting. And again, I would say you can write volume, volumes, so we have now volumes from the story of Shaduchim, from the story of Rivka and Yitzchak, and now story from the, a parenting from the stories of Avram and his children and Yitzchak and his children. But as I said, I'm being brief, but there are many, many lessons that can be learned from it. And ultimately, not in any way just rejecting, at the end of the day, Esau and Yaakov reconcile. When Mashiach comes, they'll completely reconcile. Yishmol does tshuva. So the Torah is a real book about real life. It's not just to tell us about those that were perfect human beings. Now obviously there's deeper spiritual meaning in all these stories, but there's also practical lessons. Above all, parenting is a great gift, but a great challenge. When Moshe was on the Mount Sinai and the Malachim claimed and argued to God, give us the Torah, Tanei Hoytcha B'Shel Shamayim. And ultimately, it's not in heaven. And Hashem tells Moshe, tell them, explain to them why the Torah belongs to you. And one of the things Moshe says, it says, honor your parents, your father and mother. Do you have parents? 
Malachim don't have parents. So parenting is not happening in heaven. It happens on earth. And on earth, they're both things. There's great gift and great challenges. But you have the power to shape a life, shape lives. So children don't belong to parents. Parents are like gardeners, caretakers. And we see how much parents can have impact on children in a beautiful way, and unfortunately sometimes not. So when you need to have good parenting lessons, you open up Chumash and look at Avram and Sarah and look at Yitzchak and Rivka and look how they dealt with their children. Yaakov also had his challenges with his children. With Yosef, the brother selling him into slavery. It wasn't simple matters. We're talking about very serious issues. But when you read closely, you'll find that there was the constant sensitivity and a constant care. It wasn't about them, the parent. It was about the child and what you have to do. It doesn't always go easily. And there's, as I said, much to be learned from Yitzchak's attitude to Esau, even though Rivka and Yaakov took a different approach. But the Torah tells us both. So, as I said, I'm not going to go into more details now. It really deserves its own. I want to do justice to it and therefore staying away from actual specifics. But it's just general principles that we can learn from them. <clears throat> the general balance between chesed and food. What does it mean that Avram's children will be like the stars? There are only a few thousand visible stars to the naked eye, so it can't mean that. But there are more than trillions of stars in the universe, so does it mean that Avram will have trillions of children? Well, when you look at the expression, it says that they'll be multiple like the stars across all the heavens. So first of all, Avram's children today are all over the world. So in that sense, it's not necessarily exactly like the number of stars, but in their expanse, in their scope. They spread throughout the whole heavens. And the same thing with Avram's children. Now remember, Avram's children includes Jews, which are also spread all over the world, but not just Jews. Avram's children also include Bnei Yishmael and Bnei Esav, which covers basically the entire Christian Western Roman world, Edem, and including Bnei Yishmael, the entire Muslim, Arab Muslim world. And if you count the many other nations, some say they also derive from Avram Avinu. As far as the actual number goes, I believe there may be some commentaries that talk about it, I don't know if you could say, because there are no trillions, there are no trillions of human beings. But that's how I would uh, explain it. Because remember, the point is not a, it's not a quantity thing. It's about impact. Avram was one man, Sarah was one woman. And you think, okay, they had their children, their families, and that would be it. No, they become so prominent, they're covering the entire sky, covering the entire span, expanse of earth, that we see them and their effects, and like stars, shine. They are children and the progeny of Avraham Avinu. Okay, let's... Um, is it appropriate for from women and girls to wear those nose rings today? We know that the Imois, at least, Rivka wore them, but it seems that it is frowned upon today in our community. Is that a mistaken notion? Look, the Torah does not tell you it's a mitzvah to wear a nose ring. There's a thing called culture. There are things in each time it's placed... I'm sure the clothing that they wore, that's the patriarchs and the matriarchs, the Ovis and the Mois, are not the same clothing we wear. Different part of the world, a different time in history. So the things that are eternal is when the Torah tells us these are the mitzvahs to do. There are Minhagi Yisrael customs, but not everything that's passed on. As I said, exactly how they dress then. They dress very differently. And so many other factors that are different. So no, I don't see it about frowned or not frowned. Everything in its time. There are lessons we know. There's a famous sikha from the Friedrich Rebbe to the women in Riga. We talked about the different type of jewelry that women wear and the lessons to be learned from it. But that's Rukhni's Dika lessons. It doesn't mean that a woman has to wear all those uh, different type of jewelry. Some wear, some don't wear. It's not even a mitzvah to wear jewelry. But it does beautify. And each time in society, each time and period in history, there are different things that are beautifying, that as long as they're according to halacha, that's fine. There are things today, I'm sure, ornaments, that didn't even exist 100 or 200 or 1,000 years ago. So we have a Torah that tells us what's acceptable, what's not. And after that, it's already optional. 
So that's the answer to that. Being that we're on that topic, dear Rabbi, thank you for your generosity and openness. I have a question, and I don't mean to be irrespectful. But what is the difference between the head covering for women in Judaism and the head covering in Islam? And how can you fight the latter without being against the former? If you don't want to address it, I'll, un- it, I'll understand. Well, I am addressing it. So first of all, as we know, many things were learned from the Torah that were applied in other religions and other faiths and other schools of thought. So the very concept of a married woman covering her hair, uh, maybe it's a beautiful thing that other cultures and other religions adapt, adopted some of it or part of it or, 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 or similarities to it. I'm not sure the reasoning why it is. Is it due to modesty or other factors? Now the question is, in Islam it could be the coverings are far stronger, you see, in some of the Muslim countries, women cover from head to toe. You never find that in Judaism. There's a concept of tzniyas, a modesty, and this covering definitely parts of the body that are supposed to be covered, but not to that extent. So I'm not, I'm not going to make a comparative study, but the principle of modesty that Judaism so advocates, which means walking with dignity before God, and others learn from that. I see that as a virtue. So I'm not here to criticize Muslim dress, Islam or Muslim type of dress. Every country has to deal with it. I know there's issues in different countries, but that's not something I'm going to comment on. It's not my domain or, or matter. I mean, it's a religion. People are part of that religion. They respect it, so on. I mean, do I have general comments that I could speak about Islam or Christianity or other schools of thought? We all have comments. But as far as I said, the beautiful parts of it is they're trying to implement modesty, and hopefully it works. But modesty also has to sometimes have measure. So you can talk about that. But I don't have much to say, and I'm not here to go and fight the latter without being against the former. Who's fighting the latter? I mean... I, I, I haven't showed any rabbis or anyone I know that I respect that is fighting the way Muslims dress. I mean, fighting maybe if, if Muslims behave in ways that are inappropriate or terrorist and so on, but not to, to dress. Everybody has their codes. And within Judaism itself, you'll find different communities have different standards, and God bless them all. It's not our job to figure out what you know, Sunni is by definition. Besides the basics that we all accept, there are different standards in different cultures and different countries and different communities. Okay. How should we respond to the latest bout of anti-Semitic vitriol? Dear Rabbi Jacobson, how are we supposed to look at all the anti-Semitism that is coming up in this country? We have it from the right and from the left, and most recently, all of this Kanye West business he has millions of followers who have now been introduced to these old anti-Semitic tropes. Tropes, is that how you pronounce it? Or tropes, tropes. Do we have a future on this, in this country? Reading all the Jewish news about this can be quite anxiety-producing, especially with rise, the rising of physical attacks on Jews that we've seen throughout the last few years. Thank you very much in advance and hope you are feeling well. Rabbi Jacobson, another question in this, uh, in this vein. I first want to send you blessings and continued success for your guidance and teachings of Yiddishkeit. My question relates to the movement which has been in the news of black people enslaved in America and colonies referred to as the Israelites. Black Hebrews is the movement. Is this idea and the anti-Semitic propaganda associated with this movement something the Jewish people should respond to? I remember hearing that there will be a time when other nations will claim to be quote-unquote true people of Israel. What, if anything, should we as a people do to educate those who seem to want to be Jewish but have no knowledge of Torah or Jewish history? Is it possible these are descendants of the lost tribes of Israel? Your insight and guidance would be very appreciated. Thank you. Okay. So, a few key points here. Let's just first of all talk about anti-Semitism. I want to make you aware that I've spoken about this topic quite extensively over the years. And we actually, if you go to MeaningfulLife.com, on the front page you'll see an opening slide that leads you to a landing page with links to many different angles on this topic. 
which will do far more justice to it than I can do in these short minutes. But there you'll find a lot of material, classes, articles. In, in essence, there's two key things to remember when dealing with anti-Semitism. Yes, it's an age-old, maybe the longest discrimination, and all the longest sin in history in a way, going back to uh, Ace of Saint Eli Yaakov, that Ace of hated Yaakov. The way Teirik Siddis explains it, that there's a fundamental this, um, hatred. And um, the word I was using for was even despise of Esav to Yaakov, which reflects sometimes the despise of the material to the spiritual. And we see it throughout history, whether it's the Egyptians enslaving the Jews, and later the Persians and the Romans, and the, before that the Babylonians. And throughout history, the expulsion of Jews, the genocide of Jews, the Holocaust, ultimately. So it's a long history. And therefore we have a lot of literature. More than that, we have a history of how we dealt with it. Number one was, we did not get defined by it. The haters don't define us. We define ourselves. That's vital because when you're hated and when you're discriminated against, sometimes it can get to you. you. Say, maybe I should change. No, you are who you are, blessed. And for whatever deeper reasons, maybe it's part of the whole challenge in this material world where God is concealed, so His chosen people are also concealed. People do not appreciate who they are, even though in many ways they're jealous of them. And they emulate them even. The major religions, those that hated Jews most, were born straight out of Judaism, which is an irony of all ironies. The people they worship, the prophets that they, so to speak, prophet that they worship, is a complete Jew. <clears throat> and yet how many Jews were killed in his name? So we don't lose our identity. Secondly, no, we don't want to ignore it. You have to be prudent and you have to do whatever you have to do. Whether it means locking your doors today or whatever it did, and you see Jews negotiated and try to um, in some way, appeal to their hosts. I mean, Yosef actually turned Egypt into a superpower, and he was loved for that. And then they turned on the Jews. If you could, in some way, and that's why Jews did that. They never compromised themselves. But they definitely tried to have influence on the leaders, create more benevolence. In some instances, there were Jews who were great advisors to different uh, non-Jewish leaders and helped the Jewish people. Negotiating, the Rabbeim negotiated, they went to Petersburg, say negotiated as much as they were able to, to try to make the conditions for Jews easier. So you have to always make an effort. You can't just lock yourself up and say, Hashem will protect us. Efforts were made. Like Yaakov. How did he prepare for this arch enemy of his, Ace of Saint Eli Yaakov? He prayed, he prepared for war, and he prepared a bribe to appease him. Thank God the prayer and the appeasement was enough. But we have to prepare and be prudent. And therefore, we don't take it lying down. And especially today, when we do have a voice, and that's what makes it unique. There was a time you couldn't protest. There was no one to protest to. I'm talking about in this world, only to Hashem. Today, we have that ability to speak up. And today, we also know, and this has been said by many Jews and many non-Jews, that it begins with Jews, and then it ends up attacking everyone. As soon as you attack an innocent person, you're attacking all innocent people. The Jews were the miners' canary, as that was called. They're the first. They're always the ones that are picked on the scapegoats in the beginning. So it's really an attack against the human race, if you really think about it. As I said, many non-Jews recognize that. And look at history. Had Hitler Yemach Shemay not picked on the Jews, he, first of all, may have been much more successful. But he didn't just pick on the Jews. He went and attacked Russia and he attacked anyone that he felt was an enemy. Thank God that in a way, if he had only picked on the Jews, it may have been easier a little because then he wouldn't have started a war with others. But it doesn't work that way because hatred is hatred. When you hate, you hate. Very hard to start drawing lines where you stop your hatred because it's coming from a place that's not rational. And finally... So that means we have to stand up and say whatever we have to say. Use our power, use our influence. It's not just, you know, slap me and I ignore it. No, you have to protest and make sure 
and prosecute if necessary. But the key is not to become defined by that prosecution. Like someone told me, yes, we need the anti-Semitic organ, the anti-anti-Semitic organizations. But let's not identify ourselves as being anti-anti-Semitic. Too many Jews say, what makes you a Jew? I'm anti-anti-Semitism. No, we have to be for. And that's the ultimate point, that the Jews are here to bring light to the world. The fact that darkness fights light and darkness sometimes hates light, it's the problem of darkness. We continue to forge ahead in prudent ways, in practical ways, but we continue to bring light. And what is light? The message of God that every human being was created in the divine image. And the mission is to be a virtuous person, a giving person, a righteous person. Look at Avram Avinu. Didn't he have enemies? He had plenty of enemies. They threw him into a, into a fire. And many other challenges. But he continued his message of kindness, of chesed, lasis doko mishpat, charity, virtue, benevolence, compassion. And it changed the world. So we're here as those witnesses and we continue on. And there are the final throws of, we'll call it the darkness, that pops up here and there. And I say final throws because we're told Mashiach is right on the threshold of Mashiach. That doesn't mean that Mashiach and the Gula is here completely, as we see from these acts, especially when they become violent. As far as the issue recently, with his, the, the, the new version, or I don't know if it's new, of black Israeli Israelites and that the Jews stole their heritage from them, First of all, there's a lot of nonsense that's completely based on ignorance. I mean, if someone can identify Jewish roots, it doesn't matter what color they are, by all means, if they go through a conversion, according to Allah, we also know they're Jewish. So we have, we have guidelines. No one's going to dictate to the Jewish people what makes a Jew a Jew. But once it comes with hate, then right away you know there's another agenda going on. You know, it's one thing. If people would say, we're a lost tribe. Or we have customs. Maybe the story with the Ethiopians. Not getting now into the controversy. Should they be converted? Are they Jewish? Are they not Jewish? And conversion actually was an act of compassion because since they may have lost certain guidelines, halacha guidelines, it was to make sure that everything is right. So you just you do that. It's called a suffolk geir, which means that even if you don't know for sure, but someone is assumed to be Jewish, just to make sure you go through a geir so there's no doubts. But once it comes with hatred and other stuff like that, then you're dealing with a whole different reality. And hatred is, a, is a, a cancer of its own. And you can't always deal with it rationally, meaning I'm going to rationally explain to someone. So getting into debates about these matters is not the way. You do whatever is possible to protect the innocent and don't let anyone discriminate and badmouth and stereotype and use every pressure possible, whether it's on campus or in media or any other way. But at the same time, we have to become even more proud Jews and live up more to our legacy because at the end of the day, that's what little light dispels much darkness. And whether they know it or not, sometimes the most anti-Semitic are the ones that are most, I would say the word jealous, but in a way respect, but hate that aspect of the Jewish people. So the fact that we try to assimilate or hide it is not going to solve the issue. That's even more in a way, many even more repulsive to many anti-Semites. And the day will come when they will all recognize the one God and the role of the Jewish people. And we have to do our job to live up to it. And definitely not get into the gutter on that level and stoop, but on the contrary, to always stand proud and continue our mission in this world, to be witnesses of God, ambassadors of God, of light and goodness and virtue, tzedakah and mishpat. Okay. Okay, now I have to choose because I was going to cover a lot more, but uh, that didn't work out. So let me see what I'm going to do right now. So let's do a little follow-up. Dear Rabbi, hello from Woodstock, New York. In Temple, our rabbi was talking about how our patriarch Abraham pleaded with God not to destroy Sodom if there were at least 50 righteous people. They didn't find any righteous people, so God was allowed to destroy Sodom. But it's apparent that Abraham found a formula to help avert destruction, destructions, 
And that's when there are 50 righteous people, God is not allowed to destroy a city. But in that case, why did God allow the Holocaust and the destruction, the destruction of European Jewry? There were a lot more than 50 righteous people in Europe. There were more than 6 million righteous people. Well, as we know, when it comes to this topic, I don't have an answer. Yes, there were more than 50 righteous people. There were one and a half million innocent children. These are the mysteries of God that we can argue with God and protest. Why, why? But at the end of the day, we don't know why. And I cannot answer why. We have to answer the different question. What are we going to do about it? As we discussed before. The why of, of anti-Semitism, the why of hatred, the why of genocide, the why of the Holocaust is beyond us. Yeah, and I wish Avram stood up to God and said, how could you allow such a thing? So there is a form there, and we're told, and we continue to maintain being righteous is the way to go. But there are mysteries that we do not understand. It says, Eit Hashem be. Mashiach comes, we'll thank God, we'll acknowledge God for afflicting us in a way like understanding. I don't know if it's understanding or Eit Hashem. But we're definitely not there right now. So I wouldn't look to, ways, to find ways to justify and explain that even though they were righteous, this happened, that happened. It's from the mysteries, and that's what we need to accept. It's what I heard many times from the Rebbe, I saw it in letters. The why, if God wanted us to know why, he would tell us why. It means that we can continue on without knowing why, but we ask, what are we going to do about it? Another question. I'm going to try to pray, phrase this respectfully, as you often ask. If, but I do want to make sure to highlight how odd this is. Lloyd is asking, is asked by the angels about the people of Sodom. He says the majority are wicked. Did Lloyd just speak Lashon Hara? Were the angels willing, soliciting and listening to Lashon Hara? Obviously they were not interested in Shaduchim. Okay. Well, let's put things in context. Lashon Hara. The angels were sent to destroy Sodom as we're told in the beginning of the chapter. They knew exactly why they were coming, because God heard the cry from his name and saw their wickedness and decided time has come. So it's true, Avram prayed for them, but that didn't work. And Sudan was going to be destroyed. They didn't need light to tell them. So number one, it wasn't lost in the heart. Number two, when it comes to right and wrong, and good and evil, there's no concept of lost in heart. It's clarity. It would be like saying... There are murderers out in the street, but I can't talk Lashon Hara, so I'm not going to tell you that. There's danger involved. The, 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 the citizens of Zedem were dangerous people. When it comes to that type of thing, Lashon Hara does not apply to a raider, for example, a murderer, someone's running with a knife around. Lashon Hara is a very different reality. So Leit was simply telling them a fact, firstly, that they knew. Not that, that justifies it. It doesn't mean Lashon Hara you can speak just because others know the facts. You're still not supposed to speak bad about others. But here we're talking about a real danger. We're talking about a, cr a criminal city, criminals. So that's the, the obvious answer to that question. Okay. And finally, I'll do this. Is Lee Zeldin losing the election? We're talking about for the governor of your New York. Is Lee Zeldin losing the election for governor a sign from Hashem that he's being punished and publicly embarrassed for marrying out of the faith and gleefully parading his daughters around the state during the campaign? It's a bigger barrier to marry out of the faith and Hashem won't tolerate it. Zeldin could have and should have gone to the Shatkan like everyone else does and married an Isha Schail. But he made a bad choice in his life and now he doesn't get to make bad choices for New York. Okay, I guess this is not, you're not really asking a question, you want to make a statement. I don't go into that type of rhetoric. Um, a Tinik Shanishba would be with the category, I would put it, I don't know the man, but I'm sure he didn't know much better, and that's not justifying his behavior. If anything, what you should do is make an appointment, go see him, and kindly learn a little Tehrach this with him, and don't criticize him, the way the Rebbe taught us. Teach them about Yiddishkeit. That's what you do. So this whole tone, this approach of judgmentalism, and what are you going to say about if he did win or others that win that are 
not exactly uh, fully observant. So I wouldn't go into that type of uh, character assassination. He didn't know better, and uh, yes, he should learn. I don't think it has anything to do with winning or not winning. I can't tell you that answer. Maybe Hashem has his plans. I don't know those plans. I said mysterious plans that God has. But that's the, just the general gist of what I would say about this. Now, I will say I got a little more than I thought I'd cover, so that's good. And there's more questions, and I will continue to address them. So with that, I'd like to conclude this uh, program of My Life Considered Supplied. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Everyone have a very blessed week. Let us learn our lessons from the Rebbe Rashab and the blessings that he's given us and the strengths to be true soldiers in bringing the light of God, the light of Taylor, the light of Chassidus to the world. Good, thing, good idea to learn some of the Rebbe Rashab Chassidus this Monday and Chof Cheshven. And the week of Chayasara, the eternal legacy the Chayasara left us all, and especially the women of Israel. And may we march this week, as early as possible, into the Gula Mitzvah Vashlemet with a total eradication of Ruach HaTuma Avimina Oretz, all the negatives, the toxins, the hatred, the discriminations. A world will be Oz Epech Al Am Sofa Brud of Ohisal Hashem Am Lucha, total unification of all the nations, including Esav, in serving one God, all in unity. Will the Mola Aras Deus Hashem Kamayim Layom Achasim? Be well and a good week. Thank you. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chasidis Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chasidisapplied.com slash donate.